a great pleasure to welcome Michael Jack Hawkins from the uh, XRN, who is going to talk about a, a restoration of a 1934 triple screw Thornycroft motor yacht. Um, and, uh, and, and look forward to hearing what you have to say. Over to you, Michael. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. And um, evening. first of all, thank, thank you very much for the warm welcome that I've received since I uh, since I arrived here uh, in this lovely setting. Just a, a brief uh, word about myself. I, I uh, served in the Royal Navy for 32 years. Uh, I've always had a, a likeness for boats and sea time. Um, and uh, at the end, I uh, decided that uh, I'd have to give up the life at sea and. Uh, and, and joined the civilian world, which is a bit of a culture change for myself. Um, before I start, I do have two caveats. First of all, I'm not the owner of the vessel, but I am here on his instructions. He is our skipper. Uh, but I did do all of the, um, uh, certainly, uh, you know, all of the history of the boat and uh, uh, formulated basically a timeline uh, to cover the whole of her period. So it's the restoration and the history of a gentleman's yacht, Estralita. She's 88 years old now, and she has seen in her 88 years both tragedy, she served her country with distinction, she saw celebrity and name changes, and she also contributed to today's sea safety. Her owner is Tony Bilson. He's also the skipper. I've known Tony for 49 years, uh, since the moment that his sister uh, took me home to meet her mother, and Tony was there <laughs> as a long-haired 16-year-old youth um, and uh, to this day he still maintains it was me that cooked him into the Navy in, in 1973. He has a real love for classic boats, particularly wooden boats, um, and he's got over 30 years experience sailing both around the broads and uh, around the coast of, uh, of, of the UK. So he joined the Royal Navy as a boy and left after he got married and uh, started life in the retail trade. And he worked himself up over a period of time until he became a, a, a retail director for a very large supermarket chain. Unfortunately, towards the end of his working life, it was brought short because he suffered uh, a, a mental breakdown basically and he has no problem with talking about it and it's one of his traits really to, to be able to bring that sort of thing into the, uh, you know, into the limelight more and uh, you come on to a little bit more about that late, uh, later, later on. So, why buy a wooden boat? <laughs> That is a good question. They're cheap. They're cheap. <laughs> you need deep pockets. You're right there. Sir. Well, after he'd had his breakdown, he was in a situation where he thought, well, what is it that I can do? What can I actually do? I'm only 50, 50 odd years old. He's really relatively quite young. Um, and so he decided he didn't want to shed. It wasn't really him. He didn't want to get a classic car, that wasn't him either, uh, so he thought about buying a wooden boat. Now as I said, he, he's been with boats for over 30 years, he owned a very very nice uh, trawler yacht, uh, 40 foot, which he was uh, you know, cruising around the, uh, around the UK and around the broads, so thoroughly enjoyed himself on that. So why buy a wooden boat? So he decided that that would maybe be a good project for him 
um, and keeping busy and from out of under, under uh, his wife Leslie's uh, feet. So he started to surf the internet. Magic thing, the old internet. He popped in wooden boat and up popped um, this one. <laughs> so it was for sale down in, uh, in Ramsgate alongside, looking in a very sorry state. But he liked the look of it and took a bit of, bit of sympathy with the boat. And so he broached his wife, Leslie, and said, I'm thinking about buying a wooden boat. And she said, well, you can have one when I'm gone. <laughs> so so his, his reaction to that was, well, what happens if I go first? So he tentatively had another little look at it, and he thought, well, you know what? I'm going to have a go at this. So, so he put an offer in, a bit of a daft offer, he thought, and lo and behold, it popped up, and he'd actually been accepted, and the boat was his. His next problem was... What to do with his wife. How can I convince the family? <laughs> Given the situation at the time, and the fact that he'd sent the money, he had the problem of telling Leslie, who's there with him, and his daughter, Rachel, and his son, Christopher. So that's the nice and family. They're all very, very keen uh, boaters. Christopher has been boated with his father ever since he could walk, uh, and now actually runs a training organisation on the East Coast, East Coast Motorboat Training, and does all the uh, courses of RYA courses for RNI, the police, and, and very different others. And Rachel is now a children's nurse, uh, but she was very, very keen, certainly at the university where she used to do quite a lot of sailing on broads. And Leslie is a long suffering mum and wife. So he bought the boat, he told Leslie he'd got it. Three days later, when she started to speak to him again, <laughs> she said, You'd better go down to Ramsgate and have a look at it. Because he'd never seen it. He'd bought it online and never even been on board. <laughs> <clears throat> so, the find and the purchase. So he thought to himself, maybe I ought to get her checked out. And then thought, well, why waste the money? Um, he googled up again online and found out a little test called the screwdriver test. Anybody ever heard of that? <laughs> <laughs> so basically it's a flat bladed screwdriver, you take it on board the wooden boat and you start poking about <laughs> and if the screwdriver goes into the soft wood then it's rotten and if it doesn't then it's sound. So that's what he did. So she said, Leslie said you better get yourself down there so he did and he arrived, looked at the boat called Rake's Retreat, it was then called Rake's Retreat, sitting down in Ramsgate Harbour, looking very, very sorry for itself. He grabbed the key and walked on board, and immediately there was a very, very strong smell of diesel. There was water about a foot to a foot and a half deep in the, in the, uh, in the bottom of the boat. And he thought, well, I'll have a go for it. So he lifted the boards up and started poking around with the screwdriver and then he said, hang on a minute, it's not insured. If I find it, it's rotten, we're going to be in big trouble. So he stopped that immediately and decided the best thing to do would be to get a home back to Norfolk. So the feeling he got on board, he said at the time, was this will actually do me. I think I can do something with this boat. And so consequently, he went back home and faced Leslie, who said, well, and he said, it's lovely, honestly. <laughs> he said, it's absolutely perfect. So the next thing he had to do then was to be able to get the boat back up to Norfolk. So he arranged with a, a, a transporting company to get her put on a low loader. Um, and it was while this was happening 
a chap came up to him and said, I own a vocal somewhere, it's a Dunkirk little ship, and is that a Dunkirk little ship? So, I have no idea. He said, I've only just kind of got it, you know, and uh, I've, got a lot, I've got no idea about, about the history of it at all. I'm just going to do it up, you know. And he said, well, he said, if it isn't, then it should be. And then he walked away, and that was it. That was the question he got asked. So, so he, had, he had absolutely no idea. <clears throat> anyway, they got it loaded, loaded onto, the, uh, onto the transporter, and then, of course, she had to make her way from Bramsgate all the way up to Norfolk. Now, this is where it really got funny, because... When it arrived in St Olaf's, the family were there to greet the boat on arrival. The lorry driver came out of the cab, took a walk around the boat, came over and said, I am very, very sorry. He said, but when she left, she had two helm doors. And now she's only got one. Somewhere between here, on the M25, or possibly the M2, is your helm door, and I have no idea where it was. So, <clears throat> Tony was kind of... Um, a little bit worried, he was thinking, I dare go home and watch the news tonight in case there's been a major hold up because somebody's got a helm door stuck on their, uh, on the, on their bonnet. So, uh, <coughs> so he thought, right, let's get her, get her off and get her looked at and let's see what we can do with her. The driver then handed Leslie the keys, which she found quite amusing. <coughs> so, it start now, <clears throat> realism kicked in. What have I bought and where do I start? And the reason being is because the first thing he found was on the front was the keel. She'd obviously either been attacked by a shark <laughs> or hit something at a fair rate of knots because she was in a bit of a mess. And also, <clears throat> the back end, she's triple screw and everything was seized solid, including the engines. So she was in quite a bit of a state. <clears throat> Apart from that, she was pretty sound. The woodwork actually wasn't too bad. Uh, she was built of a classic design, and it was of hard, high quality hard wood. Uh, so it was teak, oak, uh, mahogany, there was some pine, but she was carvel built of pitch pine and steamed oak frames. Uh, and they used copper nails. So it kind of like helped to, to preserve her to, uh, to a certain degree. Um, and in all honesty, he, he thought, you know, I, I, I can make this into something really special. And it consequently happened that that is what he did. So they strip out some finds. So he, st he started to strip out what was actually in there and what was on board. And the good thing about it was that all the old original fittings, although some of them had been taken off and removed, it, they'd been put in little boxes and cardboard boxes and shoved under bunks and, and all kinds of things. And the other thing that he found that was absolutely black, and he thought it was a cooking pot, <laughs> dragged dragged it out, started to clean it, and then realised that it was a binnacle. <laughs> and when I started to do a bit of research on it, found that it was an Admiralty issue binnacle. Some of you may have seen these before. But it is so accurate and so good that they called it Old Harry. And it was issued to small vessels and submarines. And it's detachable. You can see that it could be bolted with wing nuts on the bottom and it's got a handle. And the handle was there so that they could lift it up and down the conning tower of a submarine or, or, <coughs> or on and off, 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 off of a, a small craft. So that kind of gave us a bit of a thinking of, well, where would he have got that from and when? So that was the first question. The next thing, they found this old cardboard box shoved under another bunk. And in it was a whole load of scrap bits of wood. And when they started to assemble them, that's what it was. And it's a signal flag box. And so consequently, he then contacted the, uh, the, the National Maritime uh, uh, Museum, who held um, pictures of Estralita, uh, original pictures, from when she was actually built. 
So his focus then was, I'm going to put her back to how she was in 1934. That's what he wanted to do. So he assembled the box, gave it a coat of varnish, drops a gun. The only thing was, there was nothing to hang it on. <laughs> so, because it, it actually went in the helm position. You know, we, we uh, found, the, found the photos there. So in actual fact, not an awful lot was missing, which was quite encouraging. And then there were more finds. He found the old original Romek fire pumps. Has anybody ever seen those before? Yeah? So there was a couple of those there. They actually polished up quite nice and actually got them to work. Um, when the boat was inspected, then ready for safety for sea, um, Romek pumps weren't actually on their lists. <laughs> so uh, they did have to, uh, have to purchase some up-to-date uh, ones to, 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 to qualify for the sea safety um, and also there were a, a set of sails. Now she's rigged, uh, she's, a, she's a catch rig, uh, she's got Bermuda sails and she will take 240 square feet of sail. Now we haven't actually sailed it yet but that is one of the things that we would really like to do now is to see if she'll actually go. But she weighs 12 and a half tons um, We'll probably need a, a decent windy day when, uh, when we give it a go. Um, but also, it could be used for helping with uh, stability, you know, from, uh, from, from, from that, that, that perspective. So now we come to look at how she's actually, uh, how she's, she actually steams along. Um, the engines were seized solid and they had to come out. The original initial engine that was put in there was a 30 horsepower Thornycroft engine, single engine, um, with a two, two to one gear ratio, which a reduction gear in, which would have given her a roundabout, according to them, i.e. Thornycroft, nine knots. And that, I think, was recorded when she did her sea trials in 1934. Um, through the period uh, between uh, 34 and 1972, two further engines were put in. Initially, one was put in by uh, Guy Baxendale, and uh, we'll talk about him a bit later on. And then another one was put in later on in the 1970s. So she ended up, that's where she ended up with her, uh, with, with, with her triple screw. But they were all Perkins engines. And I'll tell you now, they run sweet as a nut. Uh, once we've got them freed up, um, got them stripped down, put back together, and they're all, they've gone back in. Uh, so now she's running with um, the wing engines of Perkins uh, 1407 four cylinder each. So this gave her actually extra mobility, safety, in case there was a, a, a failure. We think that when the first wing engine went in, um, it was probably still a single screw, um, because you could switch from one to the other. Um, but can't confirm that. And then, <laughs> <laughs> we had to look at the electrics, and that just looked like a snake's <coughs> wedding. You, you could not, you could not <coughs> find where a wire went or what it did. And, and in fact, what he ended up doing, and bear in mind that all of this work he did himself, right? A little bit of um, supervision from, 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 from experts, but he took the whole lot on himself and at his own expense, right? There was no grants or anything like that. He wanted to do it himself. So he took one look at that and he thought, well, I don't know where I'm gonna start. I'm gonna to have to start <laughs> sort of it out. And then obviously there was, there was a 12 volt supply, a 24 volt supply. So it was all kind of, you know, looking a, looking a bit complicated. So he took it all out and he followed each bit round so that he could uh, attach it and, uh, 
uh, uh, work out where the, where the uh, starting position for the, for the engines were and where the supply was going to come from for things like what he wanted to add, like his, uh, his uh, satellite navigation system. So that in itself was quite a challenge. <clears throat> and then there was the renewal and the replacement of woodwork. Now she wasn't actually too bad. Um, you can see the forecastle there, where it's teak. Um, the corking was pretty much shot, to be perfectly honest. And he fashioned a little scraper, and he scraped all of it out, and was advised to use Sikaflex to put it all back together again, using a modern, a modern corking uh, uh, technique. Uh, and this he, this he did. He did try doing it with pitch, but nearly set fire to the boat. Yeah. <laughs> so, so decided that wasn't a good idea. And the old Sikaflex gun was a good was a good and safer, better option. There was a problem with this. Is the after cabin roof that had actually deteriorated quite significantly, and so he managed to. Uh, to, 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 to renew that, but sympathetically with the same wood that came off. So it's been put back exactly how it would have been when the boat was built. You know, from that term, from that section. So she is actually still now 87% original. You know, which is for, for, for her age, that's a pretty good, you know, a pretty good option. The other thing was that while he was doing this particular area here, just underneath it, there was a, a reinforced plate. And he couldn't understand why and what it was for. And he had a good look at it, and then he got an old Norfolk boy who was uh, working in the, in the boatyard at the time and said, what do you reckon to this? And he said, well, it might be a wrench. Winch boy might be a winch, but you said it's unlikely. So we looked at it a little bit further, and I consulted some people down in uh, in Portsmouth, where I uh, where I work in the National Museum. Had a little look around, and lo and behold, it turned out to be the support base plate for a machine gun. So again, this sort of popped up another question. <coughs> Where, where, where was the machine gun and why? You know, what, what was it all about? So again, we got online, um, and this is when I started to come on board in, uh, more on my, uh, in my own. We were sat having, uh, having a coffee, um, and he said, I'm really working hard on the boat, Jack. I really need someone to have a look at the history, because this is starting to get quite serious and I really want to know a little bit about her life and what she's all about. So I had the old parrot on my shoulder saying, yeah, I can do that, I can do that. <laughs> I do too. So that's, that's kind of how I started, to, um, started to, 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 to get on board with it. So we did have some planks to replace. Uh, we obviously had to fashion a new uh, port helm door because that was somewhere between uh, Norfolk and Ramsgate um, and there were some uh, planking down in the uh, in the build not the bilge area but just above just above the water line funnily enough everything that was below the water line was really sound and, and, it, and it's surprising really given the age and, and, and how long she'd been she'd been sat there now when she was actually built, uh, and I'll come on to it a little bit more when we come into the to the uh, to the history of the vessel, but uh, she was built for a gentleman called Mr. Uh, Francis M. Brown uh, from London, and it transpires that it, it, I think he may have been a member of this club, but I can't confirm that. Um, but he uh, commissioned the, the vessel. Paid about six and a half thousand for it at the time, which in 1939 was 
well, sorry, 1934 was quite a few bob. You know? um, and <coughs> he took it on its first maiden voyage after he took delivery of it, and she was, because when she was first built, she had a, a, a flat stern, and she was, uh, you know, 42 foot. So he went on a, a cruise to Ostend, and when he came back, he took it straight back to Thornycroft and said, I want a canoe stern fitting on this. So they added another six feet on the back of it, and this meant that they had to build uh, an iron keel at the rear um, to, to be able to support that. Uh, and this was to make it a better sea boat. So, so when Tony lifted all the, uh, all the boards up to, to, to try and get into the bottom of the boat itself, um, he found all these iron ingots. And these were all placed forward, um, individual. They were all very, very rusty. Uh, obviously, he'd taken them out, cleaned them lovingly, and uh, coated them and put them all back. Um, and this was basically to counterweight the weight of the iron um, keel at the rear of the, at the rear of the vessel. And that actually is the canoe stern. So you can see it's really, really quite neat. And um, it certainly made her a better sea boat. So you can see the brackets here to hold it up. And the, the keel runs from basically midships all the way back aft. And then the main engine screw is there in the middle with the two wing engine screws on each side, the uh, port and starboard side. But it actually makes it look quite a neat little bow now, actually. And, and it added, as I say, another six feet, um, which turned into a, uh, a rope locker and the steering gear was actually moved to the, uh, to, to, to the rear part. In that, uh, in that particular section. So she was literally um, totally put, put back together and it was the little things that happened while he was doing it that actually helped with his recovery. Mm -hmm. The fact that she was a 1934 vessel actually attracted a lot of attention and people were interested in it and obviously interested in him and this built his self-confidence up quite considerably. The other thing, one day, and he was very, very focused, he was there painting the ship's side. You see how neat he's done the, uh, he's done the line there for the water line. So he's busy there with a four inch brush, painting away with the white brush, and a gentleman came up behind him and said, um, excuse me, are you the owner? Yes, said Tony, I am the owner. And he still kept painting. And he said, do you mind, would you mind if I paint your boat? And he said, absolutely, no problem at all. He zipped up, got hold of a four-inch <coughs> four brush and a pot of paint, came back, and the gentleman was setting up his easel. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, oh, oh, I see what you mean. <laughs> these, these little things happen, you know? <laughs> And there was, a, there was another day, it was in the winter, uh, she was still out of the water and uh, he'd got a ladder up the side and the biggest mistake, and I'm sure you're all aware when your boats are out of the water, if you put a ladder up alongside the vessel and she's out of the water, you've got to tie it on. So it was a very windy day, he was up there busy, heard a crash and the ladder had gone. So, no problem, he said. I'll phone somebody up in the office at the marina and get them to come and put it back. And that's when he discovered that his phone was in his car. 
<laughs> so, so he thought, well, my first night on board the vessel is going to be tonight in the winter uh, with little or, little or no bedding. Fortunately enough, uh, a delivery driver had come to the marina and uh, Tony was waving to him frantically and uh, uh, it managed, to, uh, managed to get himself down. So, in all honesty, after a period that the, the, the woodwork had been stripped and varnished, the paint had all been redone, the planking had been redone, corking had been redone, engines had been in and out and tested and back in again. Um, she freed off all of the, uh, the, the screws so that everything was kind of like ready for her to go back into the water. Uh, so he got her lifted in and of course with her being a wooden boat there's going to be a period of time where the wood needs to take up. So he was prepared, ready for the uh, incoming water and again the old boy from Norfolk in the, uh, in the boatyard came up and said well boy what you've got to do he said is tip a load of uh, sawdust into the water let it come in, he said, that will block it up, you'll have no problem. And he said, well, I don't know whether the environmental people would be too impressed if I start tipping in going to, going to water. So he, uh, he actually got to put in uh, and, and rig some pumps. And, uh, and it, it actually, within a week, she was, she was tight, tight as a drum. And so, after five years, she eventually went to sea. So last August, on the 6th, <coughs> we uh, took her from Summerlayton down through the Broads, down to Lastoff, and then she went out uh, into the Briney and made Harwich the first day to Shotley Marina, and then down to uh, Ramsgate um, after that. Unfortunately, <coughs> we were going to try and make pool then, um, <coughs> But unfortunately, uh, the weather was quite quite bad. Uh, there was a massive swell, <coughs> 30 mile an hour uh, wind coming offshore. Um, she battled across the Thames estuary, but absolutely marvellous. She was going against wind and tide, and she was still making five to seven knots through the water. You know? So she was she was going for it. And, and where the swell was kind of like, you know, instead of going up and down, she was just going straight through it. You know? mm -hmm. And so it was, uh, it, it was quite good. But the weather did, did turn bad and, and uh, you know, we, we had to, uh, we had to make common sense. Well, quick question. Yes. <clears throat> that mainmast looks to me as if it's raked forwards. Is that, is that this, right? This one? Yeah. Yes, it is. Is that? I'll tell you why. Go on, man. <laughs> when, we, when, we, when we came out of the broads, yeah. we had to, I don't know if you've ever been there, but you've got to get underneath, through the lock, yeah, through the lock, yeah, through the, yeah. Through, through the mast down. So we'd never had the mast up before. Oh. Okay, and it was a bit of a rocky old time, to be perfectly honest with you, even though we were alongside the fueling berth at, uh, at, at Lowestoft Marina. And, um, we didn't quite get it right. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for that. <laughs> I thought it was some trick of the photographer. <laughs> no, no, no. I think you'll find now that that has been sorted. Yeah. We, we, we wanted to do it because obviously uh, she is part of RENSA, the Royal Naval Sailing Association. So she's flying her blue ensign. Mm -hmm. And with that, you get the burgee. Yeah. And we needed to get the burgee up the mast. Yeah. You know, so. We wanted to get the mast up, and basically what it was, it was these stays, and you know they've got little box screws on, yeah, and you've got to yeah. fiddle and faff about with them, so, you know. And, uh, and we were getting a bit restricted for time. To What's it like for rolling sideways, is it? She's okay. Yeah, like yeah, 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 she yeah. is, yeah, 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 it was quite remarkable, really. Um, I mean, it was a good test. That just gives you an indication of what she actually looks like now. I mean, the, 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 the mahogany inside of it really comes up good. It looks really, really clean. It's, uh, and it's, it's of its time. You know, they called them a gentleman's yacht. And you can just imagine, you know, in 19, 
in the 1930s uh, and 40s, you know, she was, she was, she was of, of, of her time, you know. The crew's quarters, forward, uh, weren't as plush as the saloon and the, uh, and, and the, and the back cabin. Um, what we did, uh, the other crew member, Tommy, uh, he, uh, me and him were in the back cabin and Tony was up front in the, in the master's cabin for him. But, um, but it, it, it's, uh, it, it's really well proportioned, you know, and uh, as I say, the, the galley has been put back, including the butcher's sink, everything has been put back as it, as it was, would have been in uh, 34, yes. I'd like to ask, you said that you had been asked to find out a bit about the history of the previous yes. owners. Yes. Did you? I did, and it's coming up in just a moment. <laughs> so that is basically what she's what she's kind of looking at now. And uh, I will slip this in now. Um, she'll be in St Catherine's Dock on the 17th of June, oh, and you're all welcome to come down and have a look at her. You'll be more than welcome to come on board and uh, unless all the run's gone, you might even get one of those as well. <laughs> so what I want to do is just kind of now look at the history and a little bit about the research. So he'd done all of the hard work and basically it was down to me now to sort of find out a little bit more about it. This picture was taken during the first launch <coughs> and sea trial in 1934. And you can see how she's got that flat stern. And you can see what a difference the canoe stern has actually made. That extra six foot actually made a massive difference um, from that, um, from that, that pers 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 perspective. The master's right as well. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, the first owner and master was Mr. F.M. Brown of London, uh, and after her maiden trip, as I said before, to Ostend, she was returned to the builder to have the canoe stern fitted, and that added another six foot to her over uh, uh, her length. The master at that time was Captain William Arthur Bloomfield. Now, he was uh, a very renowned uh, sea captain, worked for P&O, um, before that, during the First World War, he was a skipper of a minesweeper. Um, he was a very experienced sea captain, and he was employed by Mr. Brown as his uh, uh, vessel's master. And unfortunately, it was on the 15th of September, 1935, that uh, tragedy stuck, struck. There was a massive storm off of Yarmouth, Estralita was uh, moored off, she was anchored off, and she started to drag her anchor. And William <coughs> decided that he would get himself back on board, and because there were other vessels around, and she could have been a, a, a danger to other vessels. So he got in his little boat and decided to get himself out to Estralita. Unfortunately, the storm got worse, his boat got swamped, he was washed overboard, and uh, unfortunately the Yarmouth lifeboat found his body the following day. So tragedy actually struck on Estralita quite, quite early, quite early on. <clears throat> As I said before, she, she was an exceptionally, um, she, she was actually featured in, in the motorboat magazine of the 9th of March 1934 and she was described then as an exceptional well-designed and equipped vessel and it, it led to another article in the same magazine following on on the 8th, uh, April the 13th 1934 where it says that she was one of the first vessels like this, with a car radio fitted <laughs> for entertainment, uh, a high and low tension current drawn from uh, the lighting batteries, which was obviously on the, on the, uh, on the 12 volt, which 
obviously these are the same from a car, from uh, with a, with a car. But she also had a Latona heater and a paraffin stove for cooking. That was a luxury. So the next donor, um, <coughs> a man called Guy the Baxendale, Captain Guy Baxendale, actually, and uh, he again was uh, quite a, re a, 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 a renowned businessman. But before that, during the First World War, he'd served in the uh, in, in the artillery. Uh, he, he had three sons. One of them was killed at Dunkirk, one was killed on D-Day, so only one survived. Um, but they used it as a family yacht. And this is a picture of Estrelita in 1935. Uh, we believe that was taken off of Yarmouth. We've seen pictures similar to that. Um, this is in a frame and it's still in uh, the Baxendale family's uh, house. Oh, sorry, well, it's a mansion, actually. Um, <laughs> He was one of the um, founders of Pickford's, the, uh, the, the, the uh, removals company. Uh, as I say, his, his great nephew uh, contacted us and sent us that picture. Um, and, and also a little bit about the history. And um, he, he apparently was, was quite, quite well off in, in as much that he sold Estralita and bought a, a bigger, larger yacht. And uh, the great nephew that, uh, that sent us that picture said that he'd been doing the, uh, the family history and his great uncle Guy had actually bought a, a, a rather larger, much larger yacht, uh, which he sent us a picture of, um, down in the south of France. And uh, he'd been trying to trace it and apparently, the, um, the, 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 the Nazis, when they arrived in France, commandeered that vessel, and the vessel was never seen again. But it was a very much a luxury, uh, a luxury yacht. Mm -hmm. But he was very excited about Estrelita being restored, and the family are going to come and meet us when we're on this trip, the next, uh, the next trip. So uh, that was uh, that was Guy Baxendale. Then came, uh, in, in 1939, obviously war was declared. Um, we found in the Lloyd's register of yachts, of which I've got a copy on the table, you're more than welcome to have a look at any of those books on that table. Um, that, uh, you may find some other vessels in there if you're, if you're interested in around that period. But, uh, but it shows you on, in there that Lewis Clayton, again, Register her in London um, initially. Now, Lewis Clayton was the son of Thomas Clayton and sons uh, that were a very large company on the canals. Their expertise was in shipping liquids, so things like tar and, and, and that, that kind of thing. So they owned over 60 odd barges. They were the Eddie Stobart of their day. <laughs> very wealthy family, but not a very large family. Uh, there were two, two boys, um, and the, the family kind of petered out really in, in sort of late, uh, sorry, early, early to mid six, early to mid sixties. Lewis was retired. He again was a First World War veteran, only a young man. But uh, at the age of, I think he was 46 there, this is the 1939 register of September 1939. Everybody had to declare where they were living, what they were doing, um, etc. as we would if it was a, uh, you know, the censuses that we do every 10 years. Okay? So they did one in September of 39, and you can see that Lewis was actually living on the yacht Estralita in Sultan's Way, so, uh, sorry, Sultan's Dock, Sultan's Way in Pool, Dorset. So that kind of gave us a bit of a steer, really, because we thought, well, you know, 
was going to look for some sort of a military background, and, and there she is in Paul. So, so that well, that was in, uh, in, in, uh, in, 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 19, in 1939. We then found uh, a document that actually came with the boat, um, which said that she was requisitioned from the, from the 1st of June, 1940. Now, there has been some, some um, and Lewis Clayton was paid 12 pounds and 10 shillings a month by the Navy for the, for, for the requisition. There has been some uh, controversy over that because uh, I found the National uh, Archive uh, to, to, check, to check the authenticity of the, uh, of the document uh, and was told, yes, you, that document does exist and it is there and Lewis Clayton is, is on it and he was paid £12.10. So on the document we had, it got 1st of June. On the original, apparently, there's no date on it. So, you know, we don't know. Uh, we do know that there was a payment, a payment made. I then went back to the NMRN, and they said that had that payment been a part payment, that would have had a date on it. If it's got no date on it at all, you can take it that it's a month's payment. You know, so I, you know, I, it's one of those sort of kind of you know, up and down things, really. And then. Um, we know for a fact that on the um, 18th of May, 19, uh, sorry, yes, 18th of May, uh, uh, 1940, Commander Cosmo B. Hastings, Royal Navy, who was in charge of Poole, uh, then had to comply with this order. Right? It wasn't a request, really, it was an order. The Admiralty made an order requesting all owners of self-propelled pleasure craft between 30 and 100 feet in length to send all particulars to the Admiralty within 14 days from today, if they have not already been offered or requisitioned. And that was a BBC announcement on the 14th of May. Now, Hastings has got it down that uh, on that day, he went around and collected every, and his, his remit was, if it floats, if it moves, it's going. <laughs> that was his, his, uh, his, 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 his philosophy. And so con consequently, um, there were 15 fishing boats, uh, 18 Dutch schultz, I think that's the way you pronounce it. These are more or less like flat bottom boats that that that, um, that used to go around the canals in Holland, delivering cheese and wine and all that good stuff. And eighteen of them ended up in Poole, uh, unloading Dutch refugees that week, uh, and they were all put onto Brown Sea Island by, uh, you know, the, 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 the good and grace of uh, Mrs. Bonham Christie, who owned the island at the time. They were all placed on there. These vessels were there emptied and anchored out into Studland Bay. And then with uh, a group of yachts, pleasure craft, there were gondolas, there were, um, I think I was three of those. There were several, um, uh, smaller craft and also the, 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 the pleasure steamers that used to go around Port Harbour taking people out mm -hmm. on their holidays and things they all went and they went down to uh, down to, to, to uh, Dover uh, uh, to, to assist with the uh, Dunkirk operation um, there is some controversy over, over, over Estrellita's involvement in that and I will, I will answer questions on it, but I, I can't really go much further yet, yet as it stands. Um, but what we do know, and the log that you see there, and please have a look, uh, on the 3rd of August 1940, in the Harbour Commissioner's book, 
So bear in mind that the vessel was, uh, you know, commandeered and requisitioned in June. She didn't appear in that book until the 3rd of August. So she must have been, she must have been somewhere. We think we didn't know where she is, but however. So she was then used as the harbour patrol vessel. And in um, 1941, um, there's a I've got the document there. The, the Navy actually actioned a, uh, an audit of all the vessels that they requisitioned or commandeered to see what they had. And the ones that they didn't want, they got rid of. And the ones they wanted to keep, they obviously kept. And Estralita was one of those. So she saw the rest of the war out basically as a harbour patrol vessel. And when you look at what she actually had to do, so she was manned by, it was either a petty officer or a leading seaman as a coxswain. There was a gunner, uh, a stoker, plus one. And they would, there were six of these vessels all together, and they would, in, in groups of three, be going out on patrol and patrolling Swash Channel and, and that area of Pearl, Pearl Harbour. And it states on that document that she had an anti-aircraft capability. Mm. Now, the other thing that's quite interesting is because I looked at those books and I thought, <coughs> okay, you know, they did some sea time, them boys. But when you look at the vessels, and I've researched some of the vessels that are in there, they they were commandeered by the Navy locally, manned by longshoremen, and they were delivering water stores, ammunition, and such like, to vessels, to Green Island, uh, to Brownsea Island, uh, because there were gun emplacements on those particular islands. Now, the other thing about Estralita's role, she was ordered that uh, there was a, a block ship, or in fact, there was two block ships, placed strate strategically so that should the invasion actually happen, her role was to ignite the explosives on that vessel and sink it to stop any vessels coming into the harbour. And it states, if that failed, then you must scupper yourself. So there was quite a significant role that she had to play uh, from there. How much does she draw? Three foot. Three foot. So that basically is um, her her wartime service. We went to Lloyd's to see who else had the vessel, and this was the. <laughs> The list that they came back with. Some of it is actually quite neat, and the other they kind of like wrote on it and sent it all back. But it did give us an indication of what and where it was. And one of the interesting bits on there was uh, this guy here, um, Bonham Christie. So Bonham Christie was a very very wealthy family that owned Brown Sea Island, and the uh, the matriarch, the mother. Um, she was a bit. She was a bit of a stickler, to be perfectly honest with you. She kicked everybody off off the island once the war had finished. She didn't want anybody else on the island except her and her family, and that was it. Job done. Um, anyway, when she passed away, the death duties were so high that um, the island was then given to the National Trust. And if you want to go and visit it today, you can. Okay, from from there. But Richard Bond Christie, I spoke to his son. Fortunately, he passed away last December. But he said, Dad bought that boat, and, and, you know, uh, I, <laughs> because of what it did during the war. Oh, I won't mention any more about that. But anyway, so that's, that's why he said his dad, put, his dad bought the boat. Um, he, he kept it for just over a year. As I say, his mother, when the mother died, uh, you know, there were a lot of death duties to pay, and unfortunately the boat then got passed on to Mr. Dipple. Uh, he, was, he was a commodore of uh, one of the uh, large boat... Uh, <coughs> uh, yachting clubs down in down on the south coast, and um, there's a really nice little article that we found about him when he was bringing the boat from Paul 
It was 70 mile an hour winds up the stern and he was over the moon about the um, canoe stern. Apparently, even though the weather was that rough, he never even broke a cup and saucer. <laughs> so he was just a bit. <coughs> and then the other interesting character, that, that there are a lot more, but I'm conscious of the time. Um, the next one, you can see down there, was uh, a, a, a TV celebrity by the name of Huey Green. Now, do we, do we, anybody know Huey Green? Yeah. Yeah. No, you wouldn't know, no. <coughs> he was the Simon Cowell of his day. Right. <laughs> uh, and I mean that most sincerely, folks. <laughs> it was one of his sayings. So, um, Huey Green was a TV celebrity. He uh, kept the boat up on Thames Lock. Um, he was a bit of a lad. He had his assignations there. Um, and in fact, when we were working out the dates um, and apparently what transpired afterwards, um, Paulie Yates was, you know, possibly, he was, he was the father. But anyway, um, he was very, very uh, influential, really, in terms of sea safety. And you wonder why. Well, I'll tell you why. He used to use the boat to live on, and he then, in the good old days, on the end of the piers in seaside towns, would always be a variety show, and there would always be some sort of celebrity going on around there. So he used the boat to go from uh, sea town to sea town um, while he did his shows, and he would be living on the boat. And it was while he was going from Chichester to... Um, Morecambe, that he stopped uh, <coughs> as he was going round past Newlin, there was a yacht in distress. Um, there were two, two persons on the yacht, one, one was suffering, uh, I suspect, by dehydration, I mean they did say that he was poor, and the skipper was in a bit of a bad way. Uh, Huey Green, or rather his skipper, they, they, they took the yacht in tow, towed it into Newlin, and uh, it transpired that the, uh, the, the skipper had fired off all his flares. He had no flares left. They'd run out of water. They had no way of moving. Uh, so they were, in, uh, they were in dire straits. So Huey Green, once they towed him into Newlin, went up to the harbour master and said, what the hell's going on here? This guy has been firing red flares off. He's got none left. And uh, nobody's done any actions. So... The harbour master said, well, up the road here, we've got RAF St Morgan. They fly out of there at night. They use red flares all the time for targets, and we don't take any notice of them. <laughs> so Huey Green was actually in the RAF during the war, and he was still an RAF reserve officer. So he wrote a very strong letter to the Air Ministry, and then apparently, and this was recorded in the Liverpool Echo, so it must be true. Um, he went up to the uh, to, to the air ministry and said, "Right, you are putting yachtsmen and uh, fishermen's lives at risk by doing what you're doing." And it transpired after that that red flares were only to be used at sea in an emergency. So it's it, 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 it's quite a, a point and part of history, really. That the, 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 the little boat was. The little boat was, in, uh, was involved with. And then there's a, quite a few other kind of um, <coughs> people. The Dr. Goodburn uh, was, a, was a renowned sur surgeon. There's a few authors uh, that are on there. And then, uh, oh, conscious of time. Um, so finally, um, we come back to Anthony and the first trips in a restoration. I'm just going to wrap this up now. Basically, uh, what Tony wanted to do was to raise money for combat stress. This was August of last year. The announcement had been made that uh, the troops were all pulling out of Afghanistan and in all honesty, a lot of families were uh, feeling quite a considerable amount of, uh, of stress. So Tony said, well, I, I want to raise some money. I want to raise awareness. Let's, let's go on a, a sea trip, go 
John a sea trial. We also wanted to try and make Paul uh, for their 75 plus one uh, v, v, VJ Day celebrations. Um, but as I say, we got to Ramsgate and the weather, weather was against us. But we did manage to raise just over a thousand pounds in the in, in the three weeks, you know. So uh, and that and that's the, that's the crew and that's basically those that are going uh, you know over, over over the next couple of weeks. So that was Tommy. Uh, he's, he's and Tony were, were friends together on Mitchell's Bull Walk, and, uh, and obviously the old fella on the ends, you know, yours truly. <coughs> so we call her the little ship that keeps on giving, and the reason we do is that. She saved lives during 1939, 1945, being, uh, keeping Paul safe for those five years. She saved the lives of two yachtsmen with Huey Green. She's helped Tony in through a very dark period by giving him purpose. Uh, it's basically his shed on the water. And he's learned many, many skills in electrics, in chipping, in engineering, the whole lot. In, uh, in, in that time. Um, and then Tommy, who's our other crew member, it's afforded him the opportunity to, uh, he, he went on a course to learn how to do the old, uh, you know, uh, uh, web, web management. And he's been doing that and he's created a very, very nice website for Estralita. Estralita 1934, if you want to have a look at it. And last year we raised over a thousand pounds for for combat stress. This year, as I say, the, uh, the, the, the charities are going to be to raise funds for SAFA, uh, which is the Soldiers, Sailors and Air Force Families Association, and the Jenny Lind Children's Ward, which is where Rachel works um, on, the, uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the Children's Ward of the children's, children's Nurse. So that, ladies and gentlemen, concludes basically uh, my little presentation about Estralita, and I am open to any questions that you may have. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I presume that uh, on the website we can um, one can donate to these two charities. You can through yeah. the website Estralita. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank no, you. you have, totally we have actually. time for a few questions. If anybody has. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm intrigued by this original engine. Are you telling me that it, it's still there and it still works? And it runs? It's not the, 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 the main engine. Yeah. It's, 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 not, it's, a BMC, it's a BMC Perkins engine now. No. It yeah. was a, th a, a, a thorny craft. Because, because in these days it would have been petrol or paraffin, I would have thought. It wouldn't have been diesel. Yeah, they did have a diesel then, yeah. yeah. The original was a thorny craft diesel engine. Well, yeah. so, so not yeah. diesel. Another question I wanted to ask was just very simply. What happened to fuel and what was there? Because you saw that horrific picture of a big hole, and then you said, "Oh, the wood was in pretty good condition." So I'm trying to well, it was above it. It was oh, right. so it was chopped out. And what what, what was and, it made of? Uh, it was made of uh, teak. Teak. So it, so it was chopped out and, and literally re replaced. One whole new piece. Put One in. whole new piece put in. Yeah, very lovingly. Phil, uh, Phil had a question. I was wondering a very similar thing, which was that if it was so rotted out like that, how did you lift her up? Because lifting with a cradle is it's really dependent upon, on the keel being solid. So that must have been quite yeah. a challenge. It, it, was, it, was, it, 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 it was, but she had this, the, 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 the metal keel at the back end. Um, and the belly bands went, went, went around and she lifted out no problem. I just want to plug you on your historical research. I think it's fascinating. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. You have a question. Yeah, so <laughs> what was the origin of the name Estranita? Do you know? Yeah. It's Spanish. Uh, she was... I, I, I couldn't actually say why it, it was, except that it's Spanish for Little Star. And she had to change her name. And Little Star was, was, was what she came, came, came up with. So it's a good question, and it might be something I'll have a, have a little look at to see what what uh, what and why. Yeah, we couldn't understand why the the ruling that made her change from Estralita to Little Star. We 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 we've tried to find out, for, but it came from the, you know, the ministry, so there must be something. But what was she called when he bought her in Ramsgate? 
something wrong. Rake's Retreat. Rake's Retreat. Rake's Retreat. Oh, Rake's Retreat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. She was called name. Rake's Retreat. Yeah. Yeah. That, you read his name. Just before that. <laughs> yeah, it was just before. <clears throat> yeah. And how yeah. did you manage to get this copy of this uh, log? This, this log, uh, I, I am on the committee of the uh, oh. Paul, Paul Maritime Trust. So you're a custodian. <laughs> yeah. So I'm uh, a custodian, yes. Oh. And they very kindly let me take it out. Oh, brilliant. But we, we have, have to be able to see we it. have um, a lot of um, documentation like this going back to the 1700s. Wow. These, these were found when when they knocked down the old Paul Yacht Club. It was called Ham and Bones. So you, you may have heard of it. I don't know. It, it was a, it was the um, Hamworthy and Bournemouth Yacht Club, mm -hmm. and and in it was actually the Harbour Commissioner's office. It was an old property. And up in the loft was all of these books. Some of them were actually in a very poor state. Uh, some of the mice had been at, but the majority of them we managed to uh, to, to, to save, and, and we've now got them in our library in Camford Cliffs. Wow. Yeah. So, does she have a full set of sales stuff? She's. She hasn't got to will up by next week. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. Yeah. And remind us when she's going to be in St Catherine's Rock. She'll be in on the 17th of June. And just for three nights. So we're about three nights, yeah. Starting the 17th? Starting the 17th. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah, starting the 17th. Um, the reason is because it's the commemorations for the 40th anniversary of the Falklands. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, it, it's... Uh, it's a poignant time for uh, for us, and, uh, and and that's why we wanted to be to be in London. If you stayed until the Tuesday, we could have an event here. <laughs> that's bribery. So well, I could I could chat to the skipper, and if he can get birth, maybe I don't know. So she, she, she's there for the weekend. The yeah. Of yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, I hope that a number of you will make the uh, effort to uh, to go to St Catherine's. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you, you will be most welcome. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, DJ. Our, our dinner yeah, away. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'm here and you want to answer anything. Yeah. 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 Yeah.